Hello class, check this out. So I'm gonna try this screen cast and see if you can hear me. I think that's gonna work out well, so then you can always have this on your desktop. So let's take a look at chapter eight, the hip joint and pelvic girdle. <clears throat> pelvic fractures, the broken hip by numbers. How big a deal of hip fractures? Depends on your age, your gender, and the color of your skin. 258,000, the number of hip fractures reported among people 65 and older in the U.S. $30 billion, the cost to the U.S. healthcare system of falls among older adults. Falls cause 95% of the hip fractures. Uh, hip fractures are caused usually by falls, uh, mostly women. Um, white women are more likely to break a hip than black or Asian women. <laughs> Adults 65 and older who fall each year. And then hip fracture patients who die within a year of their injury, which is 20%. So <clears throat> by the time that they fall, like look at Chick Hearn. He died within six months and he fractured his hip. Um, there's countless other celebrities that have, after they fractured their hip, unfortunately they've passed away. Okay. So the hip joint, or acetabular femoral, uh, relatively stable. Um, remember we talked about the shoulder joint, which uh, allows you to be very mobile. Well, the hip joint is very stable uh, due to the bony architect, strong ligaments, of course, uh, large supportive muscles, such as the glutes, uh, functions in weight bearing and locomotion, uh, enhanced significantly by its wide range of motion, ability to run, cross over cut, sidestep, jump, and many other directional changes. And we talked about this in the semester that if you have limited hip range of motion, then where are you going to compensate? And usually you compensate above or below the joint, which would be the low back or knee. And in the clinic, that's what we see mostly is low back pain and knee pain. So it's a ball and socket joint, head of the femur connecting with the acetabulum of the pelvic girdle. <clears throat> the pelvic girdle, you have right and left pelvic bone joined together posteriorly by the sacrum. Uh, pelvic bones are the ilium, ischium, and pubis. And the femur is one of the longest bones in the body. Now if you look at the bones here, you can look at the femur, how it fits, the head of the femur fits into the acetabulum. Here's the iliac crest. Here is the ASIS, anterior superior iliac spine, and the anterior inferior iliac spine. I think I mentioned in class that if you wear those hip hugger jeans, which are not popular anymore, but they usually fit right into this area right here. So, all right. Sacrum, extension of the spinal column with five fused vertebrae. The coccyx extends from the inferior. So here it is right here, if you look at that. Now, if you like to snowboard, if you like to roller skate, if you like to do anything on wheels, you may fall and fall right on your butt. And if you do, you run the risk of fracturing this coccyx bone right here. And unfortunately, if you do, not much you can do as far as treatment except for sit on a bonnet, donut until you recover. Um, here are the bones. Here's, if you look at this, the ilium, ischium, and the pubis. So it's technically three bones right here. Now that we're stuck at home on the computer, we sit mostly on our ischial tuberosity. Make sure for exam two, you know this and what muscles attach where, because uh, that would be a good test questions. So make sure you know this diagram. Upper two-fifths equals the ilium, which is this. Okay, this is the anterior, this is the posterior, and this is the inferior. Posterior and lower two-fifths equals the ischium, and the anterior and lower fifth equals the pubis right here. So here's the ASIS, which is the anterior superior inferior, uh, iliac spine, and that's the posterior superior iliac spine. That's in the back. Those are the two dimples that you have back there. Okay. Anterior pelvis, origin for the hip flexors. You have the tensor fascia latte on the anterior iliac crest, sartorius on the anterior superior iliac crest, 
rectus femoris, anterior inferior iliac spine. Now I put these on there and I also put a study guide for the exam too so you'll notice that there are questions as far as the origin of some of these muscles. Again, it's not an anatomy class, but it's a very important for you to know that some of these muscles do originate uh, and where they originate uh, as far as injuries are concerned. The lateral pelvis, the gluteus medius and minimus, just above the iliac crest. Medially, origin for the hip adductors. So that's, you've got the adductor magnus, longus, adductor brevis, pectineus, gracilis, pubis, and its inferior ramus. Posteriorly, You've got the origin of the hip extensor. I've mentioned this in class many times. The glute max is probably the most important lower extremity uh, muscle. Uh, so weakness here can cause deficiencies above and below. Uh, so usually deficiencies or weakness in the glute max will cause low back pain and knee pain. You've got the posterior iliac crest. Okay. Origin for hip extensors is the hamstrings, the ischial tuberosity. Proximal thigh, insertion for short muscles of the hip. So gluteal muscles in most of the six deep external rotators. Greater trochanter. The iliopsoas, the lesser trochanter. Proximal thigh, origin for three knee extensors. You've got the three vasti muscles of the quadriceps anteriorly, and then the hip adductors as far as the linea aspera. So these are all important bony landmarks, and on the exam too, I will definitely look at that. So look at the study guide, look at this uh, PowerPoint, and go back to it and answer the study guide based on this, and that will help you do well on exam two. The patella, which is the insertion for all four quadriceps muscles. Uh, proximal tibia or fibula, uh, insertion for the remainder of the hip muscles. Okay, so what inserts on the proximal tibia or the fibula? Well, you've got the sartorius, the gracilis, semitendinosus. You've got upper anterior medial tibial surface just below the medial condyle after crossing the knee posteriorly. So a lot of the hamstring muscles will also flex the knee as well as extend the hip. So make sure you know the difference because I believe that is a, a question on exam two. What do most of the hamstrings do? And they do flex the knee. Patella fractures, look at that. Uh, how do you get that? You fall right on your knee. What's it going to look like in the clinic? Bam. Ouch. Look at that. You can put your finger right through there. Usually require surgery, screws, plates, wires. Uh, just depends. Usually those don't heal on their own. Now, if you get a hairline fracture, they can heal on their own, but this guy right here, nope. Some pins, some screws wires <laughs> unfortunately this is going to take a while to recover semimembranosis which is another hamstring posterior medially on the medial tibial condyle biceps femoris is laterally more on the outside and starts primarily on the fibular head so make sure you know the difference between the semimembranosis and the biceps femoris and where they attach the it band this is what you guys usually foam roll all right, and uh, of the tensor fascia lati. Where does that re uh, insert? Anterior laterally on Gertie's tubercle. I think this is definitely on the exam too, so make sure you know that. Anteriorly, <clears throat> two pelvic bones join to form the symphysis pubis. Posteriorly, the sacrum is between the two pelvic bones and forms the sacroiliac joints. You've got strong ligaments unite these bones to form a rigid, slightly movable joint. So ligaments reinforce it. Now, if you were into dance, if you were into ballet, unfortunately, you've overstretched these ligaments. And as you get older, unfortunately, it won't be there to hold you. And low back pain is very common as you get older. So I see a lot of dancers that come in with low back pain because <clears throat> after a while, there's no way, once you overstretch the ligaments, they don't magically just uh, uh, tighten up again, just like... Uh, um, muscles. Unfortunately, ligaments have a very poor blood supply, so the recovery is very poor. That's why if you've ever sprained your ankle, you know that it takes forever to heal. <clears throat> Large and heavy bones are covered by thick, heavy muscles. Uh, very minimal oscillating type movements occur in the sacroiliac joints, as in walking, so not much movement there. Uh, body movements usually involve the entire pelvic girdle and hip joints. In walking, hip flexion and extension occur with the pelvic girdle rotation, forward and hip flexion and backward. So there's a lot of movement going on 
flexion, extension, rotation when you're walking. And you can see if you just go to the, well, you can't go to the mall right now and uh, can't be on campus, but if you ever see people walk, watch how they walk. They're, they're, some people you're thinking, how do they walk? It's just, it's not a very efficient system. They're trying so hard to get from uh, place A to place B and you're thinking, geez. Uh, so you have to have an efficient gait pattern. Like I always tell you, I always refer to Usain Bolt. Look at his, look at some of his YouTube videos, and that guy's like a gazelle. It's just flawless. Everything works in unison. So watch him run. It's just effortless for him. And that's how walking should be, effortless. If everything works like the way it should, then you should use very little energy. But any time you have an injury or any time you have uh, issues, tight hips, uh, range of motion issues, you're going to start to expend more energy to get the same result. Here's the gait cycle. If you look at this, so heel strike. Okay, this is the, you have double support 10% of the time. So heel strike, then you load response. Your quads are working. So at heel strike, you've got the tibialis anterior and your glutes. Okay, at loading response. If you have weakness in your quads right here, you'll see a lot of people throw their knee back into extension. They'll lock their knee out. So that shows you that they have a weak quad right here. Here in the mid stance, you have the tricep surrey, which is also includes your soleus, gastroc, okay, terminal stance, heel off, again. Then you have to push off. You'll see a lot of people that have injuries, sometimes they don't push off and they'll just keep their foot flat and then pick it up again, okay? So then pre swing, you need your rectus femoris, you need your plantar flexors, then you need iliopsoas, rectus femoris, and hamstring. So you see a lot of muscles working during the gait cycle. And this is just walking. Imagine walking fast and then running. Running, we don't have double support. We're always single support. So if you don't walk normally, right. continuing on, we've got the joints. Uh, jogging and running result in faster movements and greater range of motion. So definitely you need great range of motion to be able to jog and run. Again, it goes back to the common theme that if you have limited hip range of motion, you're going to compensate somewhere else, and most people will compensate either at their knee or their hip. Um, pelvic rotation increases the length of the stride in running and kicking. It results in greater distance or more speed to kick. So, <clears throat> okay. The joints, the acetabulum joint, iliofemoral, or the Y ligament. Make sure you know the Y ligament. Uh, located anteriorly and prevents hyperextension of the hip. Now, again, going back to uh, ballet dance, you usually have overstretched that Y ligament and you have no support, anterior support. Uh, the pubofemoral ligament located anterior immediately and inferiorly and limits excessive extension and abduction. So make sure you know what these two ligaments do and what they prevent um, because unfortunately if you've danced or ballet you've overstretched these ligaments and you will have no support uh, or very limited support as you get older. Um, <clears throat> there's the teres ligament attaches from deep in the acetabulum to a depression in the femoral head and slightly limits adduction. Sorry. And now, <clears throat> similar to the glenoid fossa, the, the acetabulum is lined around most of the periphery with a labrum. So you see this labrum. Uh, Alex Rodriguez actually tore his labrum right here to enhance stability. You'll see that in a lot of uh, baseball pitchers because they're pivoting and then they'll tear this labrum. Um, usually it re requires surgical intervention uh, to either, depending on where the tear is, and uh, usually they do real well. So. The ischiofemoral ligament extends from the ischium to the trochanteric fossa of the femur. is located posteriorly and limits internal rotation. So the joints, there's some disagreement about the exact possible range of movement in the hip joint. So a lot of you, <laughs> this is 0 to 130 degrees of flexion. Some of you don't have this. Some of you are at 90, 100. And it just depends. That's why if you're trying to do squats, sumo squats, and if you, we saw those movement presentations, not everybody has the range of motion to be able to do those uh, squats. So you'll compensate. You'll compensate at the back. You'll compensate somewhere else. Remember, we talked about that butt wink that occurs. Well, if you don't have that range of motion, then you'll compensate somewhere else and you'll flex that spine there. Extension, this is key, 0 to 30 degrees of extension. If you don't have that extension, guess what? You'll extend at your low back, okay? 0 to 35 degrees of abduction, so that's going out. Sometimes you you need 45 degrees, okay? Or 0 to 30 degrees of adduction, okay? Interrotation, you need 
45 degrees of internal rotation. Sometimes all we have is 35 degrees. And then if you need more, then you'll compensate at the knee or low back. 50 degrees of external rotation, which is going out that way. This, some of us only have 45 degrees. Some of us only have 25 degrees. Then you're going to compensate somewhere else. So it just depends. This is a, a kind of a general guideline, 0 to 45, but you can get by with 35. 0 to 50, you can get by with 45. Uh, same thing here. Uh, prefer to have 45, but you could probably get by with 35 degrees. Um, I'm not going to ask you what normal range of motion is because, again, this is not an anatomy class. I just want you to know that, hey, you'll probably compensate somewhere if you have limited range of motion. Uh, pelvic girdle moves back and forth within three planes for a total of six different movements. All pelvic girdle rotation results from motion at one or more locations. Again, hip and lumbar spine motions accompanying pelvic rotation. So this is uh, what's happening. Uh, you don't really need to memorize this entire uh, chart. I just wanted you to kind of understand what's going on. A lot of things going on all at once. Um, anterior and posterior pelvic rotation. You do need to know this, um, that anterior pelvic rotation, this is, I refer this as to uh, J-Lo. Uh, she has a severe anterior pelvic rotation. That's accomplished by pelvic hip flexion. So I may ask that on exam too associated with anterior pelvic rotation, what is it? And that's hip flexion. Your flex, your hip flexors are flexed. That means you're going to have tightness in your hip flexors and weakness in your glutes. Okay, And you're going to have elongated, and you're going to have weakness in your abs as well. So if you see someone with anterior pelvic rotation, you need to work their abs and you need to work their glutes. Posterior pelvic rotation accomplished by hip extension and slash lumbar. So they're going to have tightness in their glutes. So you stretch those out. Okay. Right and left lateral pelvic rotation, lateral or frontal plane. Okay. So if you see this pelvis, is this is lateral pelvic rotation and this is right lateral pelvic rotation. Right transverse or clockwise pelvic rotation, left transverse or counterclockwise pelvic rotation. So if you look at this, is the top view down, so you get this pelvic rotation. A lot of times people don't move their hips when they walk. It's very, it's very unnatural, uh, but you'll see the pelvic doesn't move. So what happens is they'll try to overcompensate above in their, in their low back, uh, try to get their arms to swing more because their pelvis doesn't really rotate. And that's a problem. You can also, if the pelvis doesn't rotate, then you're going to put more shear on your knee as well. So again, you're going to compensate above or below whatever is limited. Uh, left transverse rotation accompanied by right hip external rotation, left hip internal rotation, and slash or right lumbar rotation. So this is hip flexion. This is hip extension. You can see if you have limited hip extension, look, you'll start compensating at her low back. Her hip extension is actually pretty tight. That means her hip flexors are tight here, and then she's compensating at her low back. Here's hip abduction. Okay. We don't like to see that the body is going laterally, so she limits it right about here, and then her back kicks in. See that? And then her back kicks in. So she goes here, and then her back kicks in. A deduction. You need this for a lot of sports. If you don't have this, you'll start rotating. <clears throat> hip extra rotation. This is key. We need a lot of hip extra rotation, but the, the one that's actually more important is hip inter rotation. When you lack hip inter rotation, you'll compensate at your low back or your knee. So hip inter rotation is key. Diagonal abduction. Diagonal A deduction. This is all soccer. But hip horizontal A deduction movement of the femur in their horizontal plane and horizontal A deduction movement of the femur in their horizontal transverse plane. Here's that pelvic rotation I was telling you about. See where you've got anterior movement of the upper pelvis. Iliac crest is forward. You've got this anterior tilt, so your hip flexors are going to be tight and your back's going to be tight. So your glutes are weak and your abs are weak. In the posterior pelvic tilt, you're going here. Okay, so upper rotation, iliac crest, 
So here your back's going to be tight, and I'm sorry, weak, and your hip flexors are going to be weak because they're elongated. Anytime a muscle is elongated, it's weak. You've got left lateral pelvic rotation in the frontal plane. Again, these are Shakira, Shakira, right? Hips don't lie, so she's uh, got some good pelvic rotation. Right lateral rotation in the frontal plane, the right pelvis moves inferiorly. Either the right pelvis rotates downward or the left pelvis rotates upward. Left transverse pelvic rotation in the horizontal plane, the pelvis rotates to the body's left. Right iliac crest moves anteriorly. Right transverse pelvic rotation, so you want to know and see what these motions are. The iliac crest moves anteriorly in relation to the iliac crest. All right, so <clears throat> what now? What do you do about all these? Well, <laughs> if you see, and this is very important because at the end of the day, well, all, what, what does all this mean, right? All this, we go back here. What does it all mean? Well, if your left hip internal rotation is less than hip, Right hip intra, well, you could see ligamentous laxity. You could see some possible true hip internal rotation deficits. And then here's how would you correct it? Well, you'd mobilize the left hip. Okay. If your left hip external rotation is less than that. So what I've basically put on this chart is what I would see in the clinic. And what's the rationale? What would happen? Why is that happening? What do I see in the clinic? And then how I would fix it. Okay, so these are these are some good things that you want to look at uh, if you have, and you can check on yourself and say, hey, is my left hip tighter than my right hip in internal rotation? Is my right external rotation tighter than my left external rotation? Uh, um, and you can see why that would be. Is it anatomical? Is it ligamentous? And what would, would be the observations, and then how would I fix it? So this is really good for you. Um, and this is seated hip rotation. So you would sit and just check your internal and external rotations here. Okay. Here's prone hip. So you're on your stomach and you're checking here. Okay. This is not bad, but if one was 10 degrees and one was 33 degrees, I'd be more concerned. All right. Not end of the day, but this is just the end of the session. I'm going to break it up here. So this is end of part one.